Quiet, please. Studio 42 now recording. Welcome to Studio 42 Author Interviews. Did you know that there are 4 million books published every single year? No, I didn't actually. And three quarters of those are self-publishers. That is quite a lot. So if you're someone who's just slaved away for a couple of years writing a book and you've just finished your manuscript and you think, oh, okay, what do I do next? Imagine trying to compete with 4 million other new releases I imagine that would be extremely difficult. It's a tough market out there at the moment. We're going to discuss this and more with British-born Australian author Zena Shapter. Zena has co-written several children's books. In 2017, she published her first novel called Towards White. In May of this year, she will be releasing her second novel, When Dark Roots Hunt. She's also won a number of awards for her short stories, as well as a Ditmar Award for Best New Talent. Zena, welcome to Studio 42. Zena Shapter, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Do you think that anyone is capable of writing a book? Um, I think anyone is capable of writing. I mean, <laughs> in a way, I think everyone should write. It's so cathartic, um, whether it's journaling or poetry or creative writing. Uh, well, I mean, I should say any creative form would be great. Obviously, I'm prejudiced with, with writing. Um, so I think everyone should should be creative, and if that's writing, then great. But being a writer, well, that's something different. You can, everyone can get the skills that you need to be a writer, but you also need temperament. So often that's being a deep thinker and deep feeler, and you need self-discipline. And if you don't have self-discipline, then you could never finish the project, then call yourself a writer. Mm. We, were, we were actually saying earlier that there are four million books that are published each year and three quarters of those are self-published. Do you think it's getting harder for writers to get noticed in a really overly saturated market? Yes, probably. Um, for those people who are self-publishing, I mean, there's no there's no way of, of waving a flag and saying I'm here just because it's on an online bookstore. That doesn't mean to say people know it's there. Mm. Um, so unless they can get some press or they can um, get it into their local library which or, or the, the local bookshop, which I'm a big fan, I, I think all libraries and bookshops should have a local author section where it's just people from the local area and then people could discover them just to give local authors more of a chance, um, self-published, published, whatever. Um, but unless they can get people to find the book, then no one will ever find the book. Mm. Do, do you think that's also the same with people who go down the published route versus the self-publishers? Do you think that there is a problem even with going down the traditional route, that there's just so many books out there um, that it's still difficult to get to get noticed? Definitely. Um, and especially with, you know, the type of marketing budgets that publishers have. So there's a lot of onus on, on the authors to do the marketing. Mm -hmm. And some authors are can, can take to that better than others. So if we're saying, you know, a, a writer needs to be skilled at writing and, and focusing on the fiction side of things, then they're not necessarily going to be good marketers, but they'll be disadvantaged by not then being a marketer because the mm -hmm. publishing houses are relying on you to do So you get really, really good books, really worthwhile books. Being published by a commercial publisher and, and still slipping away. Mm. Have, have you ever self-published before? I haven't self-published any of, of my work, but I have self-published, well, I mean, I guess it's not self-publishing, but kind of is. So from my writers group, um, Northern Beaches Writers Group, I, I published their work, and that often might include um, elements of, of my work, if that makes sense. So so we do anthologies, um, mm -hmm. short stories, so I'll, I'll slip one in, but it's mainly, you know, for the, the writers group, and I'm just joining in with it. Um, or we did, see, now I'm already saying we did because it was, it was, it's a collaborative project. Um, we published a whole bunch of books to raise money for the Kids Cancer Project one year, published, well, not one year, over five years. We kept entering the Write a Book in a Day competition and winning. Um, <laughs> so tell us about that. Tell us about Write a Book in a Day. Well, it started from a conversation where some of us were just feeling incredibly um, 
happy to be able to be writers and passionate about our work and, and, and living that, that, that life. And we wanted to give back to the community, but we didn't want to walk a marathon um, or climb anything, you know, the traditional things that people do to raise money. And then we stumbled across this write a book in a day competition where you, you raise money for the Kids Cancer Project um, out at Westmead Hospital. Mm-hmm. Just sort of write an entire book in, in one day. Um, so in the morning they'll send around, and all, lots of schools do it, but we were adults, so we entered the open competition. Any writers out there who love the challenge, I definitely recommend it. It's so much fun. you just got to get a group of 10 writers together, well, maximum 10, can be less, and they'll send you a bunch of parameters in the morning, um, this type of character, this type of character, in this kind of setting, with that kind of problem, go. What's the minimum um, word count? Like is, is it um, I or a maximum even? I think from memory maybe about 10,000 words. Okay. Um, 10,000 in one so, day. Yeah, so wow. this is one, for example, The Guitar Wizard. So it's quite a slim book. Yeah. Um, and all, you don't print it to this degree. Um, you just print it out and then you, you do have a cover, but probably not that cover because that's been then finessed. Enter the competition mm-hmm. and then, um, yeah, you see who wins and then that's a bonus. But we just happened to win one. We just happened to win five years in a row wow. and we just thought, well, let's publish them. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. We've got five. So do you each take a character or, because I'm just trying to think of character continuity here through the chapters, how... How do you know, like, is it just one person per character? Um, it's one person per chapter. So we'll, we spend a lot of time discussing the, the plot yep. and making sure what is happening when, and then we divide it up into chapters and what's going to happen at the beginning and end of each chapter. And we've already decided on the characters, the main characters. So we write from that character's perspective. Um, everyone knows where to start and finish their chapter. And then we do a read through and then everyone comments on it and then everyone goes away and touches up their chapter and then they send it to me. And then I'm sat there for hours <laughs> quickly going through as fast as they can and try and just get one voice, a cohesive voice. Mm. So it really helps if you have other writers who are already similar. In I was going to say because I can imagine in, in different chapters that someone's thought oh well little johnny should go and jump out of a plane or something and someone else says no 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 he's scared of flying <laughs> so you can't yeah. write that like yes the editing yeah. process is very good and then in that time other people are doing layout or drawing pictures because it has to be illustrated as well because the the um, books then go to Westmead children's hospital for for the kids to read and so you want to make them as as good and entertaining as possible it's a really fulfilling day so we start at like mm-hmm. eight in the morning and finish eight at night something like that and- Let's go back to the start of your life. How would you describe the first 10 years of your life in terms of how it shaped you? Reading books and stories. That, that is my fondest memories from that time, especially libraries. I still remember the thrill of just being taken. My mum would take me to the library every couple of weeks and just having that bookshelf and just going, I could take home any book mm. I want. Which book? Um, but then the books that I did kind of want, you'd take them to the counter and then there were age restrictions and, no, you can't borrow that book, you're too young. Oh. <laughs> um, so, but still, it was it was a great thrill. Um, I also love the forest and I guess that that's always, that's in my writing now, nature. Nature is always mm-hmm. a big, yeah. big theme in my writing. Um, we had a local forest. And it would be wellies on, mac on, no matter what the weather, off we go. It'd be wild ponies munching in mm. the undergrowth, these little lanes with ferns either side of them, squirrels running up branches, ducks in these ponds, and 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 just fresh air. You just feel so good mm. in nature. And and we had a beach as well where I grew up, very um, in England, so a bit chillier than Australian beaches. And the so where where were you in England? Where did you grow up? A place called Bournemouth on the south oh, Bournemouth. coast. Yeah, I yes. bought. It, I, I was actually brought up in Birkenhead. Oh, there we go. So up in the north, our beaches were all pebbles. Did yes. you have sand? 
We had sand. You had sand. Um, and therefore superior to Brighton. There's a bit of rivalry there because they had a pebble beach, but we had mm. a sandy beach. Um, so winding forward to the future, it's no surprise that now I love the bush, the beach and books. It's, yes. it's funny how you don't stray too far from your origins in that respect. Mm. That's true. And you also said that um, poetry was like a creative solace for you when you were a teenager. Yes. Um, how did it help you to navigate the journey from child to young adult? Yeah, I mean, who doesn't struggle when they're a teenager? I mean, it's just one stress after another. It's hard work exams, hard work exams. But um, I, I actually liked the work and I loved getting good grades. Um, I remember when we were reading The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy and I thought before I go write an essay on Thomas Hardy, I need to read five of his other novels oh, wow. <laughs> um, to get a feel for him and then, also in biology, I remember memorising equations and my teacher saying, you know, Zina, you don't have to memorise those. I'm like, I just want them to hand. And was then, that fun or was that more for perfection, like like perfection. That, that kind of diligence? So Definitely perfection. perfectionism. Yeah. Going into an exam and knowing your stuff, you have less anxiety. Mm -hmm. and, and handing an assignment, knowing that you've that you're probably going to get good marks. It's it's re it's really good feeling. Um, and I also did history, and I remember going up from Bournemouth to London. It was like an hour and a half in the train, but I did it because I wanted to consult some archives in mm -hmm. in London to um, get good marks in an assignment. But but it was the history side of things which which led me to poetry in a way because um, reading about all the terrible things people had done and still do. Um, I didn't know then I was like a very empathic person. I know I am now, but back then I'm just a teenager. And, and, but I felt things very deeply and I could feel this, all this hurt. And, and poetry was an outlet for, for those feelings, a, a release. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's how it was. Was there ever a point that you didn't want to be a writer? Or be in publishing because it sounds like it's it's been there right from the very start. I know, right? It's so obvious when you look back in in hindsight. But um, no, I I always thought I would write books one day. When I was young, I thought, well, I think I'm going to write books one day, but I'm too young right now. I don't have the life experience, mm. so I just go ahead and leave live my life and see where it takes me. Um, there were loads of other signs. Um, at primary school, I was accused of plagiarism. I'd written a poem about owls and hedgehogs. And my teacher said, Zena, the assignment was to write a poem, not copy one out. And I said, no, I did write it. And she's like, mm. and she had my parents called into school um, to attest to the fact that they had seen me writing it and it was in fact mine. So there was one little sign there. What did she say to you afterwards? So after your parents had come in and said, no, Zena actually did write this poem like did she come she, to you and, and say anything like I'm sorry for not believing she said, you or... she may have said sorry but I I don't remember whether she did or she didn't but she did say well in that case it's going on the wall oh and then they put it on the wall and wow. um, and she was very proud of it yeah and in a way I was kind of impressed that she thought it was that good that she thought I'd copied it but maybe a little offended because I was very, I was very good goody two shoes so. yeah <laughs> Both good and bad. Yeah, yeah, very much. And then um, uh, when I was at high school and I was about 14, there was another pivotal, you have all these pivotal moments when you look back and I'd written a, a, a romantic ballad about an innkeeper and a cavalier and it was over 70 stanzas long. Like it was all pages, <laughs> pages and pages and pages and my teacher found out about it and she said, you're going to read this out to the class. I don't know if my class were too impressed. <laughs> Having to listen to that, that poem, but um, no, that was it was nerve wracking to read it out, but um, that was good. And then when I was 16, I established a writer's group. Mm -hmm. Like, who does that? What 16 year old girl establishes a writer's group at their school? I think it's still running, as far as I know. So, oh, I founded that. Well done. Longevity, um, excellent. Yeah, but uh, there was also a moment when I was 21, 22, and um, I'd written a poem at lunchtime at work and I had it in a bag on my shoulder. I was walking home, it was Birmingham, it's twilight, I was going to the train station. And as happens often in life, someone comes and takes my bag from me and runs mm. off with it. A theft from my person. And I remember a split second thinking, that's my only copy. So I ran after him. Oh. 
Okay. I ran after him. I'm like, take my wallet. Just, just leave the bag. Just drop the bag. <laughs> take the wallet. He didn't listen. He ran off and he ran into the housing estate. And I kept going, um, but he was he was bothering me. He was pulling away from me. Um, but then, luckily, um, this car drove by, and I'm like, help, help you. And they did this quick three-point turn, raced after the guy, cut him off. He dropped my bag, ran back towards me. I'm like, I'm not going to tap at you or anything. I just, I just want back. <laughs> ran past me. Two guys got out of the car, ran after him, grabbed him, arrested him. They just so happened to be undercover policemen patrolling the area. Is a and else is just out of a yeah. <laughs> So I've got my car back. <laughs> Amazing. Well done. Is that in a book yet? No. That has to go it in a book. Absolutely should yeah. be. That's I a mean, great story. The detail of the emotions you'll be feeling would be just so authentic. Oh, it was it was crazy. It was Very crazy. brave. And then he denied it and we had to go to court and everything. So yeah, that was traumatic. Yeah. Wow. But that, that, brave, things though. like that, you know. Yeah. All right, moving on from your move from the UK to Australia, what did you notice about Australia when you arrived, aside from the lovely sandy beaches? Um, and did that move change the way you thought about writing? At that time, when I moved over here, I'd then become a lawyer, but my legal qualifications weren't recognised here. Mm. And so I really struggled to get work. My husband got work really easy, obviously, because he was from here and um, it wasn't just the legal qualifications that I was missing. It was um, the fact that I, I was an immigrant. And I even had a recruiter after a while say, yeah, oh, look, if you've got two candidates and they're equally qualified, experienced, and you like them both, why would an employer pick the immigrant over the Aussie? They're just not going to do it. And so um, I didn't get into law in the same way I had been in law in London. Um, so after a few years of you know, struggling to find my feet. And by that time I was on writing my second novel, the novel that was to become Towards White. Um, I switched to working in publishing again as a copywriter. And day one, I'm walking, I just, it, I'd found my tribe. And I'm like, I'm, this is where I belong. I need to be a writer. Even if it's just copywriting in a commercial sense, I just, I need to be a writer. So if it hadn't been for that struggling to find work as an immigrant, I may very well have, continued to be a lawyer and written uh, kind of on the side but by switching careers it, it kind of might might have sped it up mm. so, so that I, gave me a, a keener focus i think i know the answer to this question but would it be fair to say that writing and publishing um has been a, a better experience overall than law oh definitely um i kind of fell into law um because of really stupid reasons um well one main stupid reason which is money you should never pick a career because of money I, I I'd filled in those questionnaires at school that you get where it says you know you should be you could be a journalist you could be an admin assistant you could work in publishing or law journalism I tried in summer jobs at school admin I did just to earn money uh, and I tried publishing and work experience and that was great um, but then, um, and then I was working in publishing, but then my housemate and I were in Birmingham and we were sick of the cold weather and we wanted to go somewhere warm at the weekend. And, and back then you could go crazy places for like next to nothing if it was at the last minute. And a few days later, I was in Tenerife on the beach, palm trees, beautiful, clear water. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do this more often, to have a bit more money, to just... Go like that. She was studying law at the time. I picked up her criminal law book and I was fascinated. Like it was, it was just, I was just there and I was just reading it. She's like, you know, that it's not like a fun book, it's a textbook. And I'm like, yeah, it's really interesting. And then I thought, oh, well, I have my solution. I should go and retrain and be a lawyer. Then I'll have the money to come to places like this. Um, but in hindsight, that's the wrong kind of motivation. If you've got to look at all those key moments that you know, the primary school, the high school and all those other little moments and and look at those rather than doing something for money. All right, what makes your soul connect with writing? I would say writing about emotions. When I'm writing about a character's emotions, whatever they may be, that's when I feel most inspired and most connected with myself and connected with the world um 
if I can put into words how a character is experiencing the world and their perspective, and a reader can identify with that later, then then I feel like I've not only succeeded as a writer, but as a person, because the two are so entwined. So that's, mm. yeah. So would you say that your writing has been heavily influenced by other writers? And if so, anyone in particular? Oh, definitely. I think when you're first starting out as a writer, you um, you mimic. You mimic a lot of your favourite writers. Um, I think that's just part of the process. So I can see in early drafts, I can, when I if I look back at them, I think, oh, I know what I was reading when I was writing that. <laughs> I was reading Dan Brown because it's really sped up and, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of tension there yeah. and it's, it's quite you know a thriller and uh yeah that was my Dan Brown phase and then other other longer passages more descriptive and say oh that's I must have been reading a literary fiction book when when, mm-hmm. I, when I read that and um and I'm a big fan of YA um you know I love Hunger Games and Divergent and or all, all of those kinds mm-hmm. of books and um I think that's what's led me to move from um I always wrote in first person present tense. Well, not always. When I wrote Towards White, um, my first book, that was first person present tense. And, and reading more YA, I think that my voice has uh, adopted some of the flavors. And mm-hmm. so publishers, publishers are the ones who have come to me and said, Your voice seems to be more suited to YA. You should write more YA. So that's what I'm doing. Oh, excellent. Okay. So talking about your writing, could you possibly read us something from one of your books? Yes. So, well, um, it's it's always the book that you've got coming out that is always on your mind when, when you do reading. So I could read out the beginning to When Dark Roots Hunt coming out in May. Fantastic. Um, so this is chapter one. <clears throat> okay. No matter how gently I unlatch our cabin door and ease it open, it's always too loud, especially when I'm the only one awake in our soundless sleeping village. Ancient hinges groan, they can give a final creak so sharp they could sever the antennae off a water ant across the lake. My father's sleep breathing shifts, lightens. I wince and stop moving. The mud skipper bag in my hand swings. My furry, furry black pointer of spike sniffs at it. Fresh mud skippers? He bucks at the scent, then looks up at me, knowing this isn't another practice. He snaps his long downy snout around to assess my father, slowly raising two of his six leg spikes to the doorframe. Is he preparing to tap, to wake father? I place my hand on his rear just before his bushy green feathered tail and give him a tap of my own. When he faces me, I shake my head and mouth a firm no. In the moonlight, I know he can see my face. He huffs loudly, his only way of making sound. But father was up as late as anyone last night. Too tired to be roused, he rolls over and drops back into his dreaming. Thank you, Key. May everyone's sleep be as solid tonight. I usher Spike outside, close the door, and steal through a crisp, motionless air, sneaking barefoot along stilted boardwalks, salty lake water rippling underneath. Uh, underneath. Rhythmic and steady, they mask our passage with a dark lullaby, curling around the village's lakeside shadows, serenading us with a half-hearted promise that as long as I slink under open windows in the wire wood walls, as long as Spike taps gently over boardwalk connections and doesn't jump or skip, no one will hear us. A quiet blanket of night will wrap itself around us, weighted with a familiarity that whispers, everything is going to be all right. I have a good idea, the only idea, and everything will be all right. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. It's very descriptive. Tell me, when you're writing, are you in the scene? Like, are you are you basically writing and you're looking around and, you know, yes. are, you, are you visually seeing where you are and things? Yeah, definitely. I'm a big movie person. Like, mm-hmm. movies, vis- visual storytelling uh, in any shape or form, I'm a huge fan. A um, lot of my spare time is spent watching movies. Or watching. Um, so that definitely translates into my writing. I like it to be very... Um, visual I mean we are a very visual culture now yeah. which has caused a shift in the way people write as well you know back 30 40 years ago you could start off um a novel with you know Mr Smith was the type of person who blah 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 they loved to blah, full of just a whole page about the character and their backstory and the setting but now readers 
a movie wouldn't start that way. A TV show wouldn't start that way. So we don't want our books to start that way. We want to start with what a character is doing. And we're happy to discover the character as, as we read. Mm. So, um, there's yeah. And having having read Towards White, um, and my understanding is that you've been to Iceland. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That you've been to Iceland um, yourself. Did that did that reflect a lot in the book? Because it certainly seemed to. I haven't been there myself. Definitely. Um, not just reflect it, but help create it. Because the idea for Towards White had been with me since I was maybe, um, you know, just in my last few teenage years. I just finished my A-levels. Biology was a big part of my life then. And uh, I loved the cyclic nature of of the natural world, the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle, energy cycle. And I loved how complete that felt. But then there was this one element of the energy cycle that, that gave me pause. And that was like, well, when we die, our bodies join the nitrogen cycle, we decompose and, and all that. But the electrical energy is, is quite an, an efficient form of energy. So it's too efficient to just entropy off um, or dissipate as, as heat. So what if that became another form of energy? But then when I went to Iceland, um, it's such it's such a profoundly beautiful yet stark place. You have these lonely lava plains uh, and then volcanoes and glaciers and geysers and waterfalls and natural mm. springs and, and the auroras. And, and it's just so amazing a setting that some of the ideas I've been playing with kind of came more into focus. So it was part of, it helped me create the story and, and mm. is there in the story at the same time. Mm. Fantastic. Um, so I found, hmm, let's try to avoid some spoilers, but the concept itself is fascinating. And in a way, it felt quite philosophical, that sort of balance between science and philosophy and that notion that um, any society that has that gets a little bit too uh, focused on one thing, be it science or a particular religion. Uh, was that was that your, sort of maybe your beliefs or ideas reflecting, or was that so. just the character? I mean, I mean, going back to one of your quick questions at the start, and, and my answer was moderation in all things. I mean, that, I was quite surprised to hear that come out. Um, but you know, I guess in a way, that's that's there, isn't it? So you know, I don't think anyone has the right to tell anyone definitively how something is or isn't in life. Um, we, and some things we can only but guess at. We don't have all the answers. So mm. then surely there's room for an open mind for in, in all of these areas of life. Mm. So, so you've got um, another book coming out in May, When yes. Dark Roots Hunt. Um, yes. Can you tell us about the narrative in that and... Um, and yes, how people can buy your book? Well, it will be should be available at all your local um, bricks and mortar bookstop uh, bookshops as well as online. I've I've got my publishers have got amazing distribution. Um, it's a really good, exciting world. I've got the blurb here. I can I could read out. Um, uh, and it's it's very the, the dedication to the book reads. Because trying is all anyone can do. Mm -hmm. And I thought long and hard about that because I wanted to address the reader in a way because no matter where you come from in life, if, if all we can do is try. Mm -hmm. And my main character, that's her place. She's, she's trying. It's not always appreciated. Um, and, in fact, what she needs to do is, is find a place where she is where her efforts are appreciated she needs to find her tribe because we all need to find our tribe yes and, yeah. and in that place we feel uh, like our trying is, is helping in a way so anyone who's interested in in that kind of concept would enjoy the book but there's also giant ants and carnivorous trees to keep things interesting as well <laughs> We read about your ants on your website. Yes, I understand that you have yeah. quite an issue with them. <laughs> you, they follow you around. You tell us about the ants, I think. Yes. Uh, look, they just follow me everywhere. I'll be in the shower and there'll be an ant on my shoulder. I'm like, why? Are you there? How did you get there? I'll be on a plane, halfway through the plane trip, and, little, and oh, there's an ant on my leg trying to think I'm a piece of food. 
And they just follow me everywhere. So when I was um, devising when dark roots hunt, um, it just felt very natural in this in this world I was creating to have um, big giant ants. <laughs> Why not? That, that control this league. Perfectly understandable. Did you find actually when you um, moved from the UK to Australia that the the insects here are just, they're all deadly, they bite, they're all out to get you. It's quite different to being in the UK. Like I remember sitting in the garden in the UK and you'd get ladybirds and they just land on you and they were just so pretty and then they yeah. would fly off again here. You've here. got funnel webs, you've got snakes, you've got things that drop from the sky. I'm not sure what those are, but I'm sure there's something that drops from the sky. Drop Ants. Bears. And when you're in a plane, I'm sure one could drop on you. Yeah, it's because true, even, it, the, even the British bumblebees are cute. I mean, yeah. you know, they can sting you, but they're these chubby little things. They generally don't, though, do they? They're like, they're like the 747s. No. They've just got all their cargo underneath and they're just sort of like lumbering around. But here, any number of things. I think the first day we were here, we saw a redback. Oh, and my brother got bitten by a bull ant. So he was he thought he was dying. Wow. Yeah, that's no joke. That you, you your, your limb or whatever it's bitten will like, go to double the size. You'll be like yeah. an elephant hand yeah. or foot person. So, so and, I'm guessing um, the the ants that um, the ants that follow you are actually sort of like the non poisonous, non you know anaphylactic type. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. There's oh, a positive yeah. there. Oh, absolutely. If you're going to get <laughs> yeah, by something, you might as well not be going to kill you. That's a exactly that's a start. Yeah. So yeah. Right. I understand that you're a mentor to yeah. other writers. Um, what would you say is the most common issue that people have when um, trying to get their writing career underway? Um, I would say a. have got two things in my mind. I'm thinking just a straight up lack of appreciation for story structure and how it can help. Um, some people just write from the seat of the pants, pantses. Other people like structure, but structure should always be an element to just check that it's going in the right direction. Um, so you have to understand or at least know about the structural theory. Then if you don't want to pay attention to it, then that's that's fine. Write by the seat of your pants. Write something that isn't formulaic or, or um to structure, but as long as you just know it. But a lot of people who I see, they ha they don't even know um, some of the terms that I start using. And I'm like, oh, from a personal perspective, what have you gained from writing? Ooh, um, I guess contentment and peace. I'm very much at peace with myself, knowing I'm doing what. I should be doing, doing what so it I feels love. authentic. It's like the authentic Xena is a writer and that's 100%. Yes, yeah. authenticity. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having had, you know, different careers. And, and in mm. fact, you know, that, that's it, it's, it's useful when I am mentoring as well because uh, often writing is something you have to juggle while you're doing something else at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't earn much money, so you need to be earning other money. While you're, and there's this transition period between kind of the two careers. And, and because I've had, you know, a couple of career transitions, I can I can really help with that and I can identify with that. So mm. everything, everything is for a reason. Mm. Some people go through life and they never find that contentment, which is quite sad, and they search for it. And I think, I think you're really lucky if you find your place in the world and, and you have that inner peace. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have I have hope for future generations because I think in our day there was never when I did that career questionnaire at school it didn't say you could be a writer it wasn't part of the um, possibilities it wasn't a viable thing uh, and I feel this for a lot of artists and and creators and there's definitely money to be made you just got to diversify your skills and mm -hmm. and look at your skills and find well what is the avenue I could use to, what can I monetize. And you've got to think of yourself as a small business in, in that respect. And and if that was taught at school, maybe more people would pursue the creative arts, um, possibly. But it should definitely be something people should consider if they feel that that's who they are. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So you've you've published one novel. You've got another one on its way. Co-authored another one. Co-authored mm -hmm. another one. Co-authored, yes, into Torden. <laughs> Of course. Jordan. Yep. Yep. That came from doing all the write a book in a day things. We decided we, a group of us, liked writing together so much. 
Um, we thought, let's do it properly and let's get it published by a proper publisher. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we thought, what can we write about? And a lot of us were parents and we were like, we want to get kids off their screens. How do we do that? <laughs> let's write about gaming. Yep. Oh, <laughs> so, yep. So, um, so it's really interesting that you're co-writing because often writers, uh, they they do this in isolation, and they they can actually be quite, um, what's the word? Precious. Yeah, or precious. Defensive about precious or defensive about what they're doing, and what you're doing is something that's quite rare, I think, which is um, writing as a collaborative effort. Um, can you tell us about about that? Yeah, well, I think when you, when you said the question about mentoring earlier, and I was like, well, it's one of two. Things. The other thing that was on my mind was to understand that you are servicing story as a writer. Um, so you can express whatever you want in your writing, but, you know, that could also just be journaling. Um, but if you want to be, a, uh, if you want to publish stories for other people to read and enjoy, then the story has to come first. Mm -hmm. And if you can find other people who understand that anything they do is servicing the story first and foremost, Ego comes way, way down the list, and they're mm. the people that you you want to write with because then it doesn't matter if someone says mm. something about what you've written. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, I like that. Yeah, that will work the story better. That will service the end result better. So so let's do that. So if you're lucky enough to find people. It's fabulous. So is, that, then, is it a mm. sort of rigorous um, workshopping process? Like do you all do you all look at each other's work and – um, give each other pointers and criticisms and and how do you take how do you take criticisms of your own work oh Chris look no matter how well you um, take criticism no, no matter how experienced you are there's a process I find but it goes a bit like this I agree with that that's rubbish man and you do that for a bit and then the bits that you think are rubbish you just go oh, they don't know what they're talking about, or they don't read it properly. That's day one. A couple of days later, you come back and you go, well, that's right. Nah. And the one that you thought was mad before, you go, actually, they've got a good point. A couple yeah. of days later, again, you come back to the one, and then you're like, oh, actually, they've got a point on that too. Oh. And then you realise that, you know, the critiquing process is, is really important because it really makes you think about everything that you're mm. uh, writing and how, how it's being received. And if you trust your critique partners, they wouldn't be saying it unless something needed to be fixed. They might be identifying something that doesn't need to be fixed, but the fact that they flagged an area, there's something in there that needs to be fixed, whether it's what they're saying or not, there's still something in there. And so every piece you just need to really, really think about. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right, so what's next, Zena? What's next for Zena Shafter? What's next? So I've got When Dark Roots Hunt coming out in May. I do have another book coming out in the UK this year, but I don't know when, and I haven't been able to announce it yet um, because they're not ready, but it is coming out this year. I'm doing copy edits, so it's Wrong. definitely coming out, so that's very exciting. Um, and then I'm just always, I've got so many ideas um, of, of novels and I'm working on the next idea and thinking about the ideas after that. And uh, in the meantime, you just got to enjoy the simple pleasures mm -hmm. in life, I feel. And people I can... I love spending time with that. Yeah, so, so people who want to find your books who want to know more about you or maybe about your mentoring or um, all the other work that you do, where can they find you? Look, the best place is obviously my website. That's a central place where everything goes at xenashapter.com. I'm very lucky that it's an unusual name because that also means I'm Xena Shapter on all social media. Um, so just type in my name and it'll probably be me. I don't think there's any other Xena Shapters in the world. Thanks very much for joining us today, Xena. And um, we wish you all the best with the launch in mm -hmm. May and everything that will come beyond that. Thank you very much. I've had such a great time. You guys yeah, thank you very much. So everybody stay safe, find happiness and be kind to each other. Beautiful. Love it.